Physics Book 1 We understand and know from the knowledge of principles and elements. The process of reason is from the common to the proper. Things that are knowable last from our standpoint, are knowable first and chiefly in their nature, hence that which is last with respect to all human knowledge is that which is knowable first and chiefly in its own nature. Our intellect, when it is reduced from potency to act, acquires first a universal and confused knowledge of things, before it has a proper knowledge of them, as proceeding from the imperfect to the perfect. The object defined comes in our knowledge before the parts of its definition. A child can distinguish man from not man before he distinguishes this man from that, and therefore children at first call all men fathers, and later on distinguish each one from the others. Some of the ancients decided that the first principle was immovable. We must proceed from the universal to the singular. The infinite accompanies quantity. Finite and infinite belongs to quantity. Substance cannot be an accident. It has been falsely claimed that God is a body. The ancient natural philosophers maintained that primary matter was some body in act, as first, air, water, or some intermediate substance. Hence it followed that to be made means only to be changed for since that preceding form bestowed actual substantial being, and made some particular thing to be, it would result that the supervenating form would not simply make an actual being, but this actual being, which is proper to the accidental form. Plato and all who preceded Aristotle held that all bodies are of the nature of the four elements. Those ancients who admitted movement in bodies, did not consider it except as regards certain accidents, for instance, in relation to rarefaction and condensation by union and separation. Ancient philosophers considered the first contraries to be the rare and the dense. If the substantial forms of inferior bodies were not diversified save according to accidents such as hot and cold or rarity and density, which the early natural philosophers held, there would be no need to suppose some principle above these inferior bodies, for they would be of themselves sufficient to act. Plato reduced accidents to the material principles which are the great and the small which he considered to be the first contraries. If formlessness preceded in time the formation of matter, it follows that at the beginning confusion, called by the ancients chaos, existed in the corporeal creation. The ancient philosophers considered it as a common concept of the mind that nothing is made from nothing. It is the common opinion of all the philosophers that nothing arises from what is not. The nature of the infinite belongs to quantity. The infinite as such is unknown. The infinite as such is unknown. The infinite considered as such is unknown. If a finite thing is continually lessened, it must at length be done away. If from a finite magnitude a continual subtraction be made in the same quantity, it will at last be entirely destroyed, for instance if from any finite length I continue to subtract the length of a span. Supposing as they the ancients did that corporeal substance itself was uncreated, they assigned certain causes for these accidental changes, as for instance, affinity, discord, intellect, or something of that kind. That which is more universal is logically prior. The universal is known by reason, and the singular is known by sense. Whatever is made is composed of a subject and of something else. Things are made through becoming in particular, that is, from form to form either accidental or substantial. Every process of generation takes place from a contrary and from matter. 
A thing is made from its contrary accidentally but per se from the subject which is in potency. The intellect, in so far as it knows material things, does not know save what is in act, and hence it does not know primary matter except as proportionate to form. Privation is an accidental principle in being subject to motion, just as matter and form are essential principles. When a human being is born, it is a man that comes to be in an unqualified sense, a being that comes to be in a qualified sense, because a man is made, not from non-being as such but from this particular non-being. The Platonists, not distinguishing matter from privation, said matter was non-being. Bodies, as composed of matter and form, approach the divine likeness because they possess form which is called a divine thing. The more fully anything corporeal shares in the divine goodness, the higher its place in the corporeal order, which is order of place. Hence we see that the more formal bodies are naturally the higher, since it is by its form that every body partakes of the divine essence. It is in accord with its form that a thing has being, and since anything, in so far as it has being, approaches the likeness of God who is his own simple being, it must be that form is nothing else than a divine likeness that is participated in things. Form is something godlike and desirable. Matter is unbegotten. Matter is unbegotten because matter does not have a subject from which to derive its existence. Prime matter remains in its essence when the form departs. Book 2 The natural agent is distinguished from the voluntary agent. The term nature can be extended to signify the intrinsic principle of any kind of movement. Nature is the principle of movement. Nature is the principle of motion and rest in those things in which it is essentially, and not accidentally. In living things, the principle of generation is an intrinsic principle. The word nature is also used to signify any intrinsic principle of motion. Thus nature is the principle of motion in that in which it is essentially and not accidentally. To be natural is to be in accord with nature. By natural, we mean that which is caused by nature. Consequently the question as to whether a particular passion is more or less natural cannot be decided without reference to the cause of that passion. Natural is that which is according to nature, and a thing is according to nature if it has that nature and whatever results from that nature. Nature is either matter or the material form. The nature of a thing is called the essence signified by the definition. The nature of anything at all is its what is it, for the nature of a thing is what the definition signifies. Nature designates something as a form, wherefore nativity is said to be the road to nature, for the purpose of nature is terminated in the form or nature of the species. Artificial things belong to the genus of substance by reason of their matter, but natural things by reason of their form. Humanity is not one of those forms that are composition or order, as are the forms of things produced by art. A thing is moved naturally when it is moved by an active principle which it has within it, a nature is a principle of motion in that to which it belongs. Both natural philosophers and astronomers prove the earth is round. Measurable accidents can be separated in the understanding. Since that which is formal is of most account, it follows that those sciences which draw conclusions about physical matter from mathematical principles are reckoned rather among the mathematical sciences, though, as to their matter they have more in common with physical sciences, and for this reason they are more akin to physics. Democritus, and all the ancient philosophers who admitted no cause but matter, attributed the distinction of things to matter alone, 
and in their opinion the distinction of things comes from chance according to the movement of matter. Evil is only accidentally caused by the good. It works in the same way in the realm of artifacts. For art in its working imitates nature and bad results occur in both the same way. In those things that can be done both by art and by nature, art imitates nature. If the cause of a person's illness is something cold, nature cures him by heating, and that is why the physician, if his services are needed in order to cure the patient, does so by applying heat. The end is twofold, the end for which and the end by which, namely, the thing itself in which is found the aspect of good, and the use or acquisition of that thing. It is the art which is concerned with the end which, by its command, moves the art which is concerned with the means just as the art of sailing commands the art of shipbuilding. The ultimate natural form to which the consideration of the natural philosopher is directed, namely, the human soul, is indeed separate, yet it exists in matter. Man and son beget man from matter. In the semen there is a certain heat derived from the heavenly bodies. And since in this, vital, spirit the power of the soul is concurrent with the power of a heavenly body, it has been said that man and the sun generate man. Moreover, elemental heat is employed instrumentally by the soul's power, as also by the nutritive power. Whatever generates here below moves to the production of the species as the instrument of a heavenly body. In other words, man and the sun generate man. Among lower things, the more noble effects are produced not only by higher agents but also require agents of their own genus, for the sun and man generate a man. To produce perfect forms, like the souls of perfect animals, there is also required a univocal agent together with the celestial agent. In fact, such animals are not generated except from semen and that is how man and the sun generate man. Perfect living things are not generated by the celestial power alone but also from semen, for man, together with the sun, generates a man. Difference is compared to genus as form to matter, inasmuch as it actualizes the genus. On the other hand, the genus is considered as more formal than the species, inasmuch as it is something more absolute and less contracted. Wherefore also the parts of a definition are reduced to the genus of formal cause. And in this sense the genus is the formal cause of the species, and so much the more formal, as it is more universal. The father is the efficient cause of the son. Not only acts, but also organs are means. The cause of both safety and danger of the ship is the same. Two things may be causes of one another, if one is the efficient cause, and the other is the final cause. If the parts are different, the whole will also be different, since parts are to the whole as matter is to form. That is to be considered as the end and the good of other things for the sake of which something is. In order that the will tend to anything, it is requisite, not that this be good in very truth, but that it be apprehended under the aspect of good. Therefore the end is a good or an apparent good. That which happens apart from the intention of the agent is called fortuitous, a matter of chance, something which rarely happens. Effects correspond proportionally to their causes, so that we attribute actual effects to actual causes, potential effects to potential causes, and, similarly, particular effects to particular causes and universal effects to universal causes. The relation of universal causes to universals is like the relation of particular causes to individuals. 
Some ancients denied chance and fortune on the basis of the view that there is a definite cause for every effect, that everything occurs by necessity. The ancient philosophers are accused of putting chance and fortune in the makeup of the celestial bodies, but not in the things below. Things which occur always, or for the most part as they do when caused by natural agents, are neither chance nor fortuitous events, but only those which occur in few instances. Order is to be seen in things moved by nature, just as in things moved by reason. A refutation of the opinion that there is both choice and nature as two active principles but only nature i.e. that our choices originate from the influence of the celestial bodies. Intellect and nature both act for an end. Not only intellect but also nature acts for an end. What is accidental never constitutes a species, and what is outside the agent's intention is accidental. There is no reason why certain definitions should not make mention of things that are accidental, since what is accidental to one may be proper to something else, thus the accidental cause is mentioned in the definition of chance. It is a misfortune for a man if he is prevented from obtaining something good when it is within his grasp. To lack little is almost the same as to lack nothing at all. That which is little lacking is as it were not lacking at all. When little is lacking it seems as though nothing were lacking. We speak of having a thing when we can easily acquire it, hence that which is scarcely lacking is as though it were not lacking at all. Chance is a cause that acts beside one's intention. Hence chance happenings, strictly speaking, are neither intended nor voluntary. Reason is distinguished from nature. A per se cause is prior to one which is accidental. That which is accidental is posterior to that which is per se, therefore it is impossible for that which is first to be accidental. The accidental cause is subsequent to the per se cause. The same thing cannot be both the subject and the efficient cause of sin, because the efficient and the material cause do not coincide. Formal, final, and efficient causes do not coincide with one another. Matter is not a principle of acting and therefore the efficient cause and matter do not coincide. The end of generation and the form of the thing generated, and the agent cannot be identical because the end of generation is the form of the thing generated. The agent is said to be the end of the effect because the effect tends to become like the agent, hence the form of the generator is the end of the generating action. The form itself and the nature of a thing is the end and the cause why a thing is made, therefore in the first species we consider both evil and good, and also changeableness, whether easy or difficult according, as a certain nature is the end of generation and movement. God gave to each natural being the best disposition not absolutely so, but in view of its proper end. And because it is better so, not absolutely, but for each one's substance. If all things can be reduced to matter as to their first cause, it would follow that natural things exist by chance and this is not the case. Ancient philosophers claimed that all things come about as a result of material necessity for they completely excluded final cause from things. Ancient philosophers said that all things come about as a result of material necessity. The consequence of which would be that all things happen by chance and not from the order of providence. Such a natural tendency is evidenced from things which are moved according to nature, because according as a thing is moved naturally, it has an inborn aptitude to be thus moved. It is natural to all to seek and love things according as they are naturally fit, to be sought and loved, since all things act according as they are naturally fit. 
Things that are produced according to art and reason imitate those that are produced according to nature. Sin occurs in nature and art when the end intended by nature or art is not attained. Just as sin occurs in moral actions, so does it happen in art because it is a sin in a grammarian to write badly, and in a doctor to give the wrong medicine. Sin occurs in natural things and even as in voluntary matters. Sin happens even in things done by nature. Monsters are sins of nature. Sin never happens in natural things except through some corruption of the natural power, thus monsters are due to corruption of some elemental force in the seed. Nature always works in the same way if there is nothing to hinder it. Sometimes, however, the act of the will bears directly on something else which hinders man from doing what he ought, whether this something else be united with the omission, as when a man wills to play at the time he ought to go to church, or, precede the omission, as when a man wills to sit up late at night, the result being that he does not go to church in the morning. In this case the act, interior, or exterior, is accidental to the omission, since the omission follows outside the intention, and that which is outside the intention is said to be accidental. If the art of shipbuilding was in the wood, it would produce the results by nature. If, therefore, purpose is present in art, it is also present in nature. The best illustration of this is a injury healing itself, nature is like that. Nature intends the end even in things void of reason. Nature is a cause, and cause that acts for a purpose. With things directed to an end, necessity derives from the end, and not conversely. Whenever a thing is for an end, its form must be determined proportionately to that end, as the form of a saw is such as to be suitable for cutting. That which is done in view of the end should be proportionate to the end. From this it follows that the reason for whatever conduces to the end is taken from the end, thus the reason for the disposition of a saw is taken from cutting, which is its end. The end in practical matters is what the principle is in speculative matters. In appetitive and operative matters the end functions as an indemonstrable principle does in speculative matters. In movements of the soul the movement toward the speculative principle or the practical end is the very first, but in exterior movements the removal of the impediment precedes the attainment of the end. In practical things, the end stands in the position of a principle, not of a conclusion. Therefore, the end as such is not a matter of choice. As the intellect of necessity adheres to the first principles, the will must of necessity adhere to the last end, which is happiness, since the end is in practical matters what the principle is in speculative matters. Natural necessity does not take away the liberty of the will. The end is to the will as the principle to the intellect. The rule and measure of human acts is the reason, which is the first principle of human acts, since it belongs to the reason to direct to the end, which is the first principle in all matters of action. In all matters of appetite and action the measure is the end, because the proper reason for all that we desire or do should be taken from the end. The end is the principle in human operations. Book 3 Action, by its very nature proceeds from an agent, whereas passion as such is from another, wherefore the same thing in the same respect cannot be both agent and patient. Motion is the act of something that is in potency inasmuch as it is in potency. Motion is the act of that which exists in potency. Motion is the act of what is in potency. Motion is the act of a thing existing potentially. What is changed goes from potency to act, 
for change is the act of the potential as such. Change cannot take place where there is no potentiality to something else, for motion is the act of that which exists potentially. All motion or change is the act of that which exists potentially as such. Every mover is in act but what is moved is in potency since movement is the act of that which is in potency. Form is act whereas matter is potency. Movement is the act of that which is in potency. That which, in its very nature, implies imperfection of its subject, is incompatible with the opposite perfection in that subject. Thus it is evident that movement of its very nature implies imperfection of its subject, since it is the act of that which is in potentiality as such. Motion is the act of an imperfect being. Movement is the act of the imperfect. Every motion or change is in a subject, for it is the act of the movable. Movement is the act of the movable, caused by a mover. Some acts pass into external matter, e.g. to cut and to burn, and such acts have for their matter and subject, the thing into which the action passes, thus movement is the act of the thing moved, caused by a mover. In so far as man's soul is moved by God to know or will or do something, the gratuitous effect in man is not a quality, but a movement of the soul, for motion is the act of the mover in the moved. Every movement is the act of a movable thing, caused by the moving principle. Motion is the act of the movable. When one power is the mover of the other, then their acts are, in a way, one, since the act of the mover and the act of the thing moved are one act. Action and passion are one act. One and two are predicated denominatively i.e. two things are the same although they can be described in different ways. A movement which is one as to the subject, may differ, according to reason as to its beginning and end, as is the case with ascent and descent. Passion is movement. Passion is a kind of movement. To be passive is to be moved. Whatever things are identified with the same thing are identified with each other, if the identity be real and logical, as, for instance, a tunic and a garment, but not if they differ logically. It is the same way from Athens to Thebes as from Thebes to Athens. Before learning, a person needs a teacher, that he may be brought from potency to act. Action and passion coincide in the substance of motion and differ only according to different relations. In magnitude, time, and motion, finite and infinite are found according to the one and the same motion. Therefore, the infinite in one of them removes a finite proportion in the others. Infinity is attributed to a first principle. The ancient philosophers all posited an infinite first principle of things. The generation of one thing is the corruption of another and this is why in the generation of an animal and a man, wherein the most perfect type of form exists, there are many intermediate forms and generations, and hence corruptions. Anaxagoras, unlike Democritus, attributed the distinction and multitude of things to matter and to the agent together, and he said that the intellect distinguishes things by drawing out what is mixed up with matter. The separation of the parts of the world from one another at the world's beginning was effected by God's power alone, for the work of distinction was carried out by that power, and so Anaxagoras asserted that the separation was effected by the act of the intellect which moves all things. Anaxagoras argued that the world did not always exist. Everything which works by intellect works from some principle. Democritus, and all the ancient philosophers, who admitted no cause but matter, attributed the distinction of things to matter alone, 
and in their opinion the distinction of things comes from chance according to the movement of matter. Infinite reason is a first principle. In the case of eternal things, to be and to be possible are one and the same. For eternal things, to be and to be possible are one and the same. For divinity, being, and possibility do not differ. The actual and the possible do not differ in things perpetual. The essence of the infinite is that it is untraversable whereas the finite is traversable. Matter is not divisible into parts except in regard to quantity, and without quantity substance is indivisible. There is no infinite magnitude. In material things the infinite does not exist actually, but only in potency, in so far as one thing succeeds another. There is no actual infinity in natural bodies. Infinity is not a substance, but is accidental to things that are said to be infinite, just as the infinite is multiplied by different subjects, so, too, a property of the infinite must be multiplied, in such a way that it belongs to each of them according to that particular subject. It is impossible for a body to be actually infinite. The mode of prime matter is that part be taken after part. If a finite thing be continually lessened, it must at length be done away. Among natural things there is the infinite in potency, though not in act. In matter there does not exist potentiality to any particular quantity. Every finite thing can, by continual increase, attain to the quantity of another finite thing however much greater, unless the amount of its increase be ever less and less. Thus if we divide a line into an indefinite number of parts, and take these parts away and add them indefinitely to another line, we shall never arrive at any definite quantity resulting from those two lines, viz. the one from which we subtracted and the one to which we added what was subtracted, the fact that the imagination can add a certain dimension to the already existing thing is no reason for attributing infinite quantity to a body. The infinite, as such, is unknown, since the infinite is that which to those who measure it, leaves always something more to be measured. A thing cannot be apprehended as infinite since the infinite is that from which, however much we may take, there always remains something to be taken. That the infinite should be known is contrary to the definition of the infinities, which is said to be that from which however much we may take, there always remains something to be taken. The infinite cannot be understood except by a successive consideration of one part after another because the infinite is that from which, however much we may take, there always remains something to be taken. Everything that is infinite is imperfect. The perfect is that which lacks nothing. Perfection implies a certain universality, because the perfect is that which lacks nothing. A thing is whole and perfect when it lacks nothing. To love God with one's whole heart belongs to perfection, since to be whole is to be perfect. The whole is the same as the perfect. There is the infinite in regards to matter which is taken privatively that is, because it has not the form it ought naturally to have, and in this way we have infinite in quantity. Now this infinite is of its very character unknowable, because it is, as it were, matter with privation of form. But all knowledge is by form or act. Everything that is infinite has parts and matter. The infinite is unknown if we take it in the privative sense, as such, because it indicates removal of completion, from which knowledge of a thing is derived. Therefore the infinite amounts to the same matter subject to privation. The corruption of one is the generation of another. 
it is impossible for a thing to receive a new substantial form without losing the form which it previously possessed for the generation of one thing is the corruption of another thing. Book 4 The notion of a vacuum not only implies that in which nothing is, but also requires a space capable of holding a body and in which there is not a body. It is impossible for a mathematical body, which is nothing but separate dimensions, to be together with another natural sensible body. Considered in itself, matter is called invisible or void, and its potency is completed by form, thus Plato says that matter is place. There are eight modes of one thing existing in another. Nothing is contained by itself. Two bodies are not in the same place, because it would follow that the greatest body would occupy the smallest place, since its various parts could be in the same part of the place, for it makes no difference whether two bodies or however many be in the same place. A vessel is a movable place. It is not everything existing which is in a place, but only a movable body. In the case of air and water, the container is more formal than the contained. There have even been philosophers who said falsely that air is nothing, and called a space filled with air a vacuum. A vacuum is a place not filled by a sensible body. And a body is said to be sensible by reason of its matter, form, and natural accidents, all of which pertain to the integrity of nature. At first, being grosser of mind, they the ancients failed to realize that any beings existed except sensible bodies. Because bodies alone fall under imagination, the ancients supposed that no being exists except bodies. The error of the Sadducees, who said there was no spirit, Acts 23 colon 8, also arose from this source. Nothing can prevent a body from occupying the same place together with another body, except something in it that requires a different place, since nothing is an obstacle to identity, save that which is a cause of distinction. Now this distinction of place is not required by any quality of the body, because a body demands a place, not by reason of its quality, Wherefore if we remove from a body the fact of its being hot or cold, heavy, or light, it still retains the necessity of the aforesaid distinction as is self-evident. In like manner neither can matter cause the necessity of the aforesaid distinction, because matter does not occupy a place except through its dimensive quantity. Only a body fills a place, so that it is not a vacuum. Increase in bodily bulk can be achieved through intensity such as in the case with things subject to rarefaction. There is no place which is not filled with a sensible body. Negation has no species, for there is neither species nor difference of non-being. There is no movement through a vacuum, because it would follow that something moves instantaneously, since a vacuum offers no resistance whatever to a thing that is in motion, whereas the plenum offers resistance, and so there would be no proportion between the velocity of movement in a vacuum and that of movement in a plenum, since the ratio of movements in point of velocity is as the ratio of the resistance offered by the medium. The place and the object placed must be equal. Whatever is in a place occupies a place equal to itself. In so far as it is an accidental form, it is distinguishable only in respect of its subject, and in this way it has its proper increase, like other accidental forms, by way of intensity in its subject, for instance in things subject to rarefaction. The multiplication of matter is quite unintelligible, as long as the matter itself remains the same without anything added to it, unless it receives greater dimensions. This implies rarefaction, which is for the same matter to receive greater dimensions. 
that which is hot is made hotter without making something hot in the matter that was not hot when the thing was less hot. Time is the number of motion according to before and after. The continuity of motion is according to the continuity of magnitude, and according to priority and posteriority in magnitude is the priority and posteriority of the local motion of bodies. The continuity of time comes of the continuity of movement. There is a middle time between every two instances so far as time is continuous. The order of first and last in continuous movement is according to the order of first and last in magnitude. Before and after belong to time according as they are in movement. The before and after and the continuity of time follow upon the before and after and the continuity of motion. Time is the number of motion. Time is the number of motion. Every successive making must take place in time, since before and after in motion are numbered by time. The now of time remains the same in the whole of time. Time is the number of before and after. Time is the numbering of movement by before and after. Time is a number. To be in a place is to be measured and to be contained by such place. A thing which exists in time grows old with time because it has a changeable existence, and from the changeableness of a thing measured there follows before and after in the measure. The intellectual part of the soul, considered in itself, is above time, but the sensitive part is subject to time, and therefore in course of time it undergoes change as to the passions of the sensitive part, and also as to the powers of apprehension. Hence time makes us forget. Everything which at one time exists, and at another does not is measured by time. Those things are said to be measured by time which have a beginning and an end in time. What sometimes is and sometimes is not, is measured in time. The now is always the end of the past and the beginning of the future. Length of time is the cause of forgetfulness. The reason for the unity of time is the oneness of the first movement by which, since it is most simple, all other movements are measured. That which is first in a genus is the measure of all the rest. A measure should be uniform, hence that movement which is the most uniform, is the measure and rule of all movements. Effects caused by celestial motions are subject to time which is the measure of the first celestial motion. The measure of the first movement is the measure of every movement. All various and multiform movements are reduced, as to their cause, to a uniform movement which is that of the heavens. Book 5 an action may be attributed to anyone in three ways, a thing is said to move or act either by virtue of its whole self, for instance, as a physician heals, or by virtue of a part, as a man sees by his eye, or through an accidental quality, as when we say that something that is white builds, because it is accidental to the builder to be white. So when we say that Socrates or Plato understands, it is clear that this is not attributed to him accidentally, since it is ascribed to him as man, which is predicated of him essentially. Whatever is moved is in a different condition before and after. Change is the terminal point of a movement. Objects, in relation to external acts, have the character of matter about which, but, in relation to the interior act of the will, they have the character of end, and it is owing to this that they give the act its species. Nevertheless, even considered as the matter about which, they have the character of a term, from which movement takes its species, yet even terms of movement specify movements, insofar as a term has the character of end. In every change or motion there must be something existing in one way now and in a different way before, 
for the very word change shows this. Primary matter cannot be moved since it is a being only potentially, indeed, everything that is moved is a body. The teacher causes knowledge in the learner by reducing him from potency to act. A body's action is not terminated in action nor movement in movement. There is contact only between bodies, since things are in contact when they come together at their extremities. Increase concerns quantity. Movement from one contrary to another has the same character as movement from less to more. Now in some things we find opposition in respect of contrary forms, thus in colors we find white and black. In others we find opposition in respect of perfection and imperfection, wherefore in alterations, more and less are considered to be contraries, as when a thing from being less hot is made more hot. Those things are simultaneously existent which are in the same place. The middle is that into which a thing which is continually changed comes, before arriving at the last into which it is changed. Two points can be coincidence, as in the case of two lines touching one another, and two lines when two surfaces are in contact with one another, and two surfaces when two bodies touch one another, because contiguous things are those whose boundaries coincide. Movement, if continuous, is one and the same. There is a twofold contrariety in changes and movements, one is according to approach and withdrawal in respect of the same term, and this contrariety belongs properly to changes, that is, to generation, which is a change to being, and to corruption, which is change from being. Movement is diversified according to the diversity of its to many or ending points. Contrariety of wills regards contrariety of objects, as contrariety of movements springs from contrariety of to many i.e. contrariety of ends. There is no other contrariety of movements except that of the terms. Corruption is contrary to generation. Not only is black unlike white, but also less white is unlike more white, since there is movement from less white to more white, even as from one opposite to another. A thing at rest is in the same condition before and after. One repose is said to be contrary to another when they are in contrary terms, thus repose in a high place is contrary to repose in a low place. Movement is natural if it terminates in a natural rest. Natural repose is contrary both to violent repose of the same body, and to the natural repose of another. Book 6. Two points can be coincidence, as in the case of two lines touching one another, and two lines when two surfaces are in contact with one another, and two surfaces when two bodies touch one another, because contiguous things are those whose boundaries coincide. Between two successive instants there must be time. In time we are not to consider one instant, since neither do instants succeed each other immediately in time, nor points in a line. Between every two points there are infinite intermediate points, since no two points follow one another without a middle. There is a middle time between every two instances so far as time is continuous. In magnitude, time, and motion, finite and infinite are found according to the one and the same motion. Therefore, the infinite in one of them removes a finite proportion in the others. Nothing greater results from the addition of one simple thing to another. Motion cannot be instantaneous. The so-called beginning of time is necessarily indivisible. No local movement can be sudden. Whatever is moved is divisible. Whatever is moved is divisible and a body. Motion belongs only to divisible bodies. Whatever is moved is a body. Nothing is moved except a body. 
nothing is moved except a body, so everything that receives an impression from a body must be a body or some power of a body. Nothing which is devoid of parts is moved because while it is in the term from which, it is not moved, nor while it is in the term to which, for it is then already moved. In local movement space, movement and time are equally divisible. Time, motion and the thing that is in motion are all simultaneously divided. In contraries, to be changing precedes to be changed. Whatever is in motion is partly in a term from which and partly in a term to which. Everything which is made, was being made and so to be made implies a before and after. In every making involving succession, a thing is in process of becoming prior to its actual production. Since all the aforementioned movers and things moved are bodies, they must constitute by continuity or contiguity a sort of single mobile. In this way, one infinite is moved in finite time, which is impossible. The infinite is not traversable either by the finite or by the infinite. Time is not made up of successive instants. Nothing which is devoid of parts is moved because while it is in the term from which, it is not moved nor while it is in the term to which, for it is then already moved. Book 7 Since all the aforementioned movers and things moved are bodies, they must constitute by continuity or contiguity a sort of single mobile. In this way, one infinite is moved in finite time, which is impossible. Everything that is moved is moved by another. If among movers and things moved we proceed to infinity, all these infinite beings must be bodies. Nothing is moved by itself, except, perhaps, by reason of a part of itself, as an animal is said to be moved by itself because one of its parts moves and another is moved. It is impossible for the same thing to be both active and passive, both mover and moved. Nothing corporeal, unless it be moved, is the cause of anything for no body acts unless by motion. Cause and effect must in some way be united together, since mover and moved, maker and made, are simultaneous. The mover and the thing moved must be simultaneous, and since God moves all things to their operations, He is in all things. The mover and the thing moved must be simultaneous, the motion must extend in a definite order from the first mover to the last thing moved such that the mover moves what is far away from it by means of what is near to it. The thing moved and the mover must be together. The mover and the moved must exist simultaneously and therefore there must be some contact between the mover and the moved. There is nothing intermediate between this mover moving and this thing moved by it, this thing making and this thing made by it, mover and moved, maker and made must exist together. Only accidents that can cause changes are the objects of the senses, because the senses are affected by the same things whereby inanimate bodies are affected. Neither in substance nor in shape can there be more or less because when a thing receives form and shape, it is not said to be altered, but to be made. Virtue is a certain perfection for each thing is then called perfect when it reaches the virtue belonging to it. In habits there is no alteration. Habits are perfections and perfection is of the greatest necessities of a thing since it has the character of an end. Therefore it is necessary that there should be habits. Habit is a perfection. Virtue is the disposition of a perfect thing. Virtue is the disposition of a perfect thing to that which is best. Virtue is the disposition of what is perfect, and I call perfect what is disposed according to its nature. Virtue is the disposition of a perfect thing to that which is best, and by perfect, 
I mean that which is disposed according to nature. The virtue of a thing consists in its being well disposed in accordance with its nature. Hence what is first and foremost in the virtues must be first and foremost in the natural order. It belongs to the nature of virtue to direct man to happiness, because virtue is the disposition of a perfect thing to that which is best. Virtue implies directly a disposition whereby the subject is well disposed according to the mode of its nature, wherefore virtue is a disposition of a perfect thing to that which is best, and by perfect I mean that which is disposed according to its nature. The mode or determination of the subject in regard to the nature of the thing belongs to the first species of quality, which is habit and disposition, for the habits of the soul and body are dispositions of the perfect to the best, and by perfect I mean that which is disposed in accordance with its nature. Lifeless faith, being imperfect, does not satisfy the conditions of a perfect virtue, for virtue is a kind of perfection. Simply true virtue is that which is directed to man's principal good, thus virtue is the disposition of a perfect thing to that which is best, and in this way no true virtue is possible without charity. To be perfected does not consist in being passive or in being changed. Virtue is a right disposition of the soul, as health is of the body. Habits are spoken of in relation to something. Beauty and health are two habits. Vice of the soul, as Cicero says, de quiest. Tusk. 4. Is a habit or affection of the soul discordant and inconsistent with itself through life, and this is to be found even without disease and sickness, e.g. when a man sins from weakness or passion. Consequently vice is of wider extent than sickness or disease, even as virtue extends to more things than health, for health itself is reckoned a kind of virtue. Consequently vice is reckoned as contrary to virtue, more fittingly than sickness or disease. Passion is in the sensitive appetite not the intellective appetite. Passion is in the sensitive appetite not the intellective appetite. If an alteration take place in the passions of the sensitive appetite, or the sensitive powers of apprehension, an alteration follows as to science and virtue. Sorrow, anger, and the like are passions of the sensitive soul. Things that are in the area of understanding are entirely apart from motion. The intellect is not moved through receiving forms, rather it is perfected and at rest while understanding whereas movement is a hindrance to understanding. One becomes wise and knowing in repose. Repose facilitates very much the due use of reason, hence while we sit and rest the soul becomes knowing and prudent. We are perfected by science and prudence when bodily changes and alterations of the soul's passions are put at rest. A child is potentially understanding but is prevented from understanding because of the multiform movements in him. Changes occurring in the sensible part of our nature are responsible for the fact that we are sometimes understanding and sometimes not understanding. Things of different kinds cannot be compared with one another. Plato said that the species of things are numbers, which are varied in species by the addition and subtraction of unity. Movement is like a kind of life possessed by all things existing in nature. The movement of heaven is as a kind of life to all existing in nature, just as the movement of the heart is a kind of life of the whole body. Supposing as they the ancients did that corporeal substance itself was uncreated, they assigned certain causes for these accidental changes, as for instance, affinity, discord, intellect, or something of that kind. A refutation is given against Anaxagoras and Empedocles who admit the existence of eternal movable things, but not eternal movement. 
the opinions from Anaxagoras, Empedocles, and Plato are advanced and reasons are brought forward to refute them. Refutations are given to the ancients who asserted that the word began to exist in ways impossible to truth. Anaxagoras called the intellect the source of distinction. Sometimes accidentally a thing is the cause of its contrary, thus that which is cold sometimes causes heat. Since evil and good are contraries, one of these contraries cannot be the cause of the other unless it be accidentally, as the cold heats. Thus the good could not be the active cause of evil, except accidentally. The everlastingness of time proves the everlastingness of motion. Some Democritus say that the soul is corrupted with the body. Time cannot begin or end, and consequently neither can movement, the measure of which is time. An instant is defined as the beginning of the future and the end of the past. A first instant can be assigned in which Christ's body is present, but a last instant cannot be assigned in which the substance of bread is there, but a last time can be assigned. And the same holds good in natural changes. It appears that the notion of the instant now, as being always the beginning and end of time, presupposes the eternity of time and movement. Thus is refuted those who assert the eternity of time but deny the eternity of movement. Empedocles maintained that there is a cycle of changes in the world. Some have said falsely that what is necessary has no cause. The universe of creatures which is called the macro cosm, is compared to man who is called the microcosm, as perfect to imperfect. Man is called a little world because the soul is in the body just as God is in the world. Man has some likeness to the universe, for which reason he is called a little world. The body of man is said to have been formed from the slime of the earth, because earth and water mingled are called slime, and for this reason man is called the little world, because all creatures of the world are in a way to be found in him. In animals no new act arises that is not preceded by emotion from without. That which is being moved towards something does not yet have it, but is is, so to speak, being generated in its regard, since generation or corruption are united to every movement. A thing is a cause of movement in two ways. First of itself, and such a thing causes movement by reason of its own form, thus fire causes heat. Secondly, accidentally, for instance, that which removes an obstacle. A moving cause is twofold, direct and indirect. A direct cause is one that moves by its own power, as the generator is the moving cause of heavy and light things. An indirect cause, is either one that removes an impediment, or the removal itself of an impediment, and it is in this way that ignorance can be the cause of a sinful act, because it is a privation of knowledge perfecting the reason that forbids the act of sin, in so far as it directs human acts. Whatever is moved by accident is not moved by itself, since it is moved upon the motion of another. When the principle that moves an object is intrinsic, then the movement is natural with respect to that active principle, just as we say that voluntary movement is natural to the animal as animal. The movement of an animal by which at times an animal is moved against the natural inclination of the body, although it is not natural to the body, is nevertheless somewhat natural to the animal, to which it is natural to be moved according to its appetite. Only beings that are living move themselves. A transformation is said to be natural by reason not only of an active but also of a passive intrinsic principle, for in heavy and light things there is a passive, and not an active, principle of natural movement. Before learning, 
a man is in a state of essential potentiality with respect to knowledge and therefore needs a mover to bring him to a state of actual knowledge. The intellect is in potency in two ways, first, as before learning or discovering, that is before it has the habit of knowledge, secondly, as when it possesses the habit of knowledge but does not actually consider. One already possessed of the habit of science, though he be considering potentially, needs no mover to bring him from potentiality to act except a remover of obstacles but is himself able to exercise his knowledge at will. That which removes an obstacle, is a kind of mover. That which removes an impediment is called an accidental mover. That which removes an obstacle is a kind of accidental cause. That which removes an obstacle is not a direct, but an indirect, cause. Accidentally, one thing is the cause of another if it causes it by removing an obstacle, thus by displacing a pillar a man moves accidentally the stone resting thereon. Heavy and light bodies are moved by an extrinsic mover, either generating them and giving them form, or removing obstacles from their way. The movement of heavy and light things results from their substantial form, for which reason they are said to be moved by their generator. A stone is moved upwards by a man, who is not the cause of the stone's nature, but the natural movement of the stone is caused by no other than the cause of its nature. Hence the being who generates them moves heavy and light things according to place. And the natural place of man's will is with God. Heavy and light bodies are moved by their generating agent, and by that which takes away any impediment to motion. No body is moved by itself except with respect to a part, so that one part of it is the mover and the other the moved. Just as divine providence does not wholly exclude evil from things, so also it does not exclude contingency or impose necessity on things. In an ordered series of movers and things moved, this is a series in which one is moved by another according to an order, it is necessarily the fact that, when the first mover is removed or ceases to move, no other mover will move or be moved. The first mover can be either unmoved or self-moved. There is no procession to infinity among movers and things moved. There is no procession to infinity among movers and things moved. There is no procession to infinity among movers and things moved. In movers and things moved, it is impossible to proceed to infinity, hence the first mover moves itself for what is through itself is always prior to that which is through another. In whatsoever thing there is an essential order of one to another, if the first be removed those that are ordered to the first must of necessity be removed also. Thus we cannot proceed to infinity in causes of movement, because then there would be no first mover, without which neither can the others move, since they move only through being moved by the first mover. Of all things that are endowed with movement, the first moves itself because what is such of itself precedes that which is by another. It is impossible for, at any time, there to have been no motion. Every self-mover is composed of mover and moved. Every self-mover is composed of two parts, one, the part that moves and is not moved, the other the part that is moved. Things moved by another are referred to the first self-movers. To have any good thing of oneself is more excellent than to have it from another, for what is of itself a cause is always more excellent than what is a cause through another. That which is of itself is the cause of that which is through another being. The same thing and in the same respect cannot be mover and moved, but nothing prevents a thing from being moved by itself as to different respects. In any order, that which exists through itself is prior to, and is the principle of, that which is through another. 
The first mover is made up of two parts, the moving, and the moved. The nature of the union between these parts is effect by contact which is mutual if both are bodies but on the part of one only, if one is a body and the other is not. The same thing cannot be at once in act and in potency with respect to the same thing. It cannot be said that, when a mover moves himself, the whole is moved by the whole. Everything that moves itself is divided into two parts, of which one moves and the other is moved. The mover is not moved by that which it moves in such a way that there be reciprocal motion. It is necessary either to arrive immediately at an unmoved separate first mover, or to arrive at a self-moved mover from whom, in turn, an unmoved separate first mover is reached. There is a mover which is altogether immovable, and not moved either per se or accidentally and such a mover can cause an invariable movement. God is the unmoved first mover. That which is accomplished adequately through one supposition is better done through one than through many. The continuity of several agents must be caused by some higher agent that always acts just as the continuity of the generative process in animals is caused by some higher external agent. The everlastingness of motion proves the everlastingness of the moving substance i.e. of God. The moving part of the first self-moving being is not moved either through itself or by accident. It is better that a thing be done by one, if possible, than by many. No body acts except through motion. The first motion is one and continuous. The first motion is continuous and regular. Of bodily movements, local movements are the most perfect and come first, therefore the foremost among intelligible operations are described by being likened to them. Motion from place to place is naturally the first of movements. Local motion is the first of all movements. Local movement is naturally more perfect than and prior to movement of growth and decay. Sight is superior to hearing and smell which require a natural change on the part of the object because local movement is more perfect than, and naturally prior to, the motion of alteration. The first motion is the motion of the heavens because local motion is first among all motions. This is so in regard to time for it alone can be perpetual. Motion in respect of form is naturally posterior to local motion since the former is the act of that which is more imperfect. That which is moved locally is perfect as to those things which are within, although it has an imperfection as to place because while it is in one place it is in potency with regard to another place, since it cannot be in several places at the same time. Neither generation nor alteration and growth are continuous throughout, local movement alone is truly continuous. Circular motion alone can be perpetual. Things of the same genus that impede one another are contraries. All various and multiform movements are reduced, as to their cause, to a uniform movement which is that of the heavens. Local movement precedes all other movements, terms of movement, distance, and the like are derived from local movement to all other movements. The separation of the parts of the world from one another at the world's beginning was effected by God's power alone for the work of distinction was carried out by that power, and so Anaxagoras asserted that the separation was effected by the act of the intellect which moves all things. The soul does not move itself and is in no wise moved in respect of such operations as seeing, feeling, and the like, but such operations are movements of the composite only. Book 8 the power of the first mover is not a power of size. This can be proved by the following argument. We know the power of the first mover is infinite because the first mover can move in infinite time. 
A finite power cannot move in infinite time. No power possessed by a body is infinite. An infinite power cannot possibly exist in a body. If a body had infinite power, it would move without time. An infinite power moves instantaneously. If the power of any corporeal thing were infinite, it would cause instantaneous movement. If there is anything that moves and is not moved it is the cause of eternal, unvarying movement. The power of the mover of heaven is infinite because it can move in an infinite time. Rare occurrences wherein there is need to depart from the common law, seem for the most part to happen by chance, and with such things reason is not concerned. Grace is not a passion nor a passion-like quality, which are in the sensitive part of the soul, because grace is principally in the mind. The will does not defer doing what it wills to do, except for a reasonable cause.